All right, so what we're going to do today is just have a look through um, and a read through of White Tiger, which is in your collection. So you can follow along by watching, watching and listening, or if you've got your copy of the text as well, um, you can go through that. So as you can see from the blurb, um, a summary off to the side there, um, it's from a character who rises through society. And the, the book, it's from a book as a whole, but the story you'll see as well, um, is a letter to the Chinese premier, so like a diplomat, um, who will be visiting. Okay, so um, if you've done all the pre-content, you'll understand kind of where we're talking about, and there's a little map there for you as well. Like all good Bangalore stories, mine begins far away from Bangalore. You see, I am in the light now, but I was born and raised in darkness. But this is not the time of day I talk about, Mr. Premier. I am talking of a place in India, at least a third of the country, a fertile place full of rice fields and wheat fields and ponds in the middle of those fields choked with lotuses and water lilies and water buffaloes wading through the ponds and chewing on the lotuses and lilies. Those who live in this place call it the dark darkness. Please understand, Your Excellency, that India is two countries in one, an India of light and an India of darkness. The ocean brings light to my country. Every place on the map of India near the ocean is well off, but the river brings darkness to India, the Black River. Which Black River am I talking of? Which river of death whose banks are full of rich, dark, sticky mud, whose grip traps everything that is planted in it, suffocating and choking and stunting it. Why, I am talking of Mother Ganja, the daughter of the Vedas, river of illumination, protector of us all, breaker of the chain of birth and rebirth. Everywhere this river flows, that area is darkness. One fact about India is that you can take almost anything you hear about the country from the Prime Minister and turn it upside down and then you will have the truth about that thing. Now, you've heard the Gandra called the river of emancipation, and hundreds of American tourists come each year to take photographs of na naked sadhus at Hadwa or Benares, and our Prime Minister, who will no doubt describe it that way to you and urge you to take a dip in it. No, Mr. Xiaobo, I urge you not to dip in the ganja, unless you want your mouth full of feces, straw, soggy parts of human bodies, buffalo carrion, and seven different kinds of industrial acids. I know all about the ganja, sir. When I was six or seven or eight years old, no one in my village knows his exact age, I went to what the holiest spots on the banks of the Ganja, the city of Benares. I remember going down the steps of a downhill road in the holy city of Benares at the rear of a funeral procession carrying my mother's body to the Ganja. Kusum, my granny, was leading the profession. Sly old Kusum. She had this habit of rubbing her forearms hard when she felt happy, as if it were a piece of ginger she was grating to release grins from. Her teeth were all gone. But this only made her grin more cunning. She had grinned her way into control of the house. Every son and daughter-in-law lived in fear of her. My father and Kishan, my brother, stood behind her to the back the to bear the front end of the cane bed which bore the corpse, my bore the corpse. My uncles, who are Munu, Jayaram, Devaram, and Umesh, stood behind, holding up the other end. My mother's body had been wrapped from head to toe in the saffron silk cloth, which covered in rose petals and jasmine garlands. I don't think she'd ever had such a fine thing to wear in her life. Her death was so grand that I knew all at once that her life must have been miserable. My family was guilty about something. My aunts, Rabri, Shalini, Malini, Lutu, Jadivi, and Ruchi, kept turning round and clapping their hands for me to catch up to them. I remember swinging my hands and singing, Shiva's name is the truth. We walked past the temple after temple, praying to God after God, and then went in single file between a red temple devoted to Hanuman and an open gymnasium where three bodybuilders heaved rusted weights over their heads. I smelled the river before I saw it, a stench of decaying flesh rising from my right. I sang louder, the only truth. Then there was a gigantic noise. 
firewood being split. A wooden platform had been built by the edge of the gut, just above the water. Logs were piled up on the platform, and men with axes were smashing the logs. Chunks of wood were being built into funeral pyres on the steps of the gut that went down into the water. Four bodies were burning on the gut steps when we got there. We waited our turn. In the distance, an island of white sand glistened in the sunlight, and boats full of people were heading to that island. I wondered if my mother's soul had flown there, to that shining place in the river. I had mentioned that my mother's body was wrapped in a silk cloth. This cloth was now pulled over her face, and logs of wood, as many as we could pay for, were piled on top of the body. Then the priest set my mother on fire. She was a good, quiet girl the day she came to our home, Kusum said, as she put a hand on my face. I was not the one who wanted any fighting. I shook her hand off my face. I watched my mother. As the fire ate away at the silk, a pale foot jerked out like a living thing. The toes, which were melting in the heat, began to curl up, offering resistance to what was being done to them. Kusum shoved the foot into the fire, but it would not burn. My heart began to race. My mother wasn't going to let them destroy her. Underneath the platform with the piled up fire logs, there was a giant oozing mound of black mud where the river washed into the shore. The mound was littered with ribbons of jasmine, rose petals, bits of satin, charred bones. A pale-skinned dog was crawling and sniffing through the petals and satin and charred bones. I looked at the ooze. I looked at my mother's flexed foot. This mud was holding her back. This big, swelling mound of black ooze. She was trying to fight the black mud. Her toes were flexed and resisting, but the mud was sucking her in, sucking her in. It was so thick, and more of it was being created every moment as the river be- river washed into the gap. Soon, she would become part of the black mound and the pale skinned. And then I understood. It was This was the real god of Benares. This black mud of the Ganja into which everything died and decomposed and was born, reborn from and died into again. The same would happen to me when I died and they brought me here. Nothing would get liberated here. I stopped breathing. This was the first time in my life I fainted. I haven't been back to see the Ganja since then. I'm leaving that river for the American tourists.